Thank you, Sharon. I want to welcome you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The theme this morning is repent and turn towards God. I have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, we have a new recycling uh, bin out in the back uh, of the church. It's a bright green, yellow uh, device. And uh, we're accepting paper and plastic in that unit. So um, Kenetha worked hard to get things. So the old company, uh, I guess, went out of business. And so she's contacted this new company. And uh, so there is a charge. It's uh, $60 a month, but uh, we felt because of the use that the community gives to it and that uh, we might be of service to the community and provide some community outreach in, in that regard. We also uh, have a new Google Fiber uh, system installed in the building. Uh, we're having a bit of difficulty, I understand, this morning, but uh, we'll, we'll get those issues ironed out. There's not going to be a phone in the buildings because I think most everyone has a cell phone that they carry with them and use. So um, that, that was a hundred dollar a month charge. So I thought we could do without that. We also have new email addresses. Um, Mary's had one for some time and Kanitha has changed hers. So if you're trying to reach uh, Kanitha for administrative business and so forth, um, that, that email's changed. It, it was published in last week's um, newsletter. And uh, so it'll be in there again this week. So check that for new addresses. Also, if you're in the building and want to get onto the new Wi-Fi, that uh, information is posted on the bulletin board in the back. The uh, fall uh, worship availability forms are due next Sunday, so please uh, get those filled out and turned in to Pam or to Karen, and and so they can get you uh, into the into the works here. Okay. Also, uh, speaking of recycling, because of the change on container outside, we've uh, changed one of the containers in the fellowship hall for recycling and the other ones for trash. So uh, until we um, get back to having potlucks and things like that, where we consume more disposables, uh, we'll, we'll let those two containers work for us. Also, Jesus 
scripture I've selected this morning is taken from the Doctrine and Covenants 163.11a. God is calling for a prophetic community to emerge drawn from the nations of the world that is characterized by uncommon devotion to the compassion and peace of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Through divine grace and wisdom, this faith community has been given abundant gifts, resources, and opportunities to equip it to become such a people. Chief among these is the power of a community to express locally in distinctive fashions while upholding a unity of vision, foundational beliefs, and mission throughout the world. So we continue our worship with him, 260. scripture we have today comes from the second, uh, second Samuel. I just want to skip over it pretty quickly so we can get the title together and later. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, we will talk about how that happened. She mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him son. And the Lord said, Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and he said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. But the poor man, or the rich man, had exceedingly many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one Lord of new land that he had raised, he bought it, and nourished it up, he raised it, they grew up together with him and his children and ate. From his own plate and drank from his cup, and he even cuddled up and snuggled up with it when he slept at night. And under him, this little lamb was a dog. And 
the king of Jaffa became a visible to rich man, and he spared to take his own flock and his own herd to dress for this, this visitor. But he took the poor man's lamb and he dressed it in order that he might feed the man that had come to visit him. The Lord, though, had said Nathan was possible. And he told about the parable I just shared with you about the land and things like that. David was angry. He said, Let's get this man and we'll slay him and we'll reimburse the poor man four times what he lost. Nathan said, you know, hang on a minute, This is you. This is what you've done, and the Lord wants me to share this with you. and take her into his own home. And the Lord continued to Nathan and said, Behold, I will raise up people against thee out of thine own house. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and I will give them unto thy neighbor. And she shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Just what they have done. For thou did it secretly, but I will stand before all Israel. And before the sun. Then David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord has also put away your sin, and you shall not die from it. Repentance. When you ever started by your own reflection, maybe you're passing by here. And you don't realize that it's a mirror image until the image catches you forward in your mind and you jump and you say, Is that me? Is that me reflected in the mirror that you just walked by? Or maybe one morning you can get up after a night of restless sleep and you look in the mirror, and there you see a stranger with dark circles under their eyes, a puffy face, tangled hair, or some people have changed hair, and a hollow expression. And you gasp, who is that person? Surely that's not me. Am I the only one that's ever had have one of these experiences before? We all have times when we do not recognize ourselves. Sometimes it has nothing at all to do with our appearance. Maybe you've had an interaction with someone in which you acted totally out of character. That's not unusual today. Everything that's going on in the world. Something somebody said or pushed your buttons the wrong way. You found yourself saying or doing something so foreign to your usual reaction that you now recall an order to say, Me? You can't think about it now without getting the, the, the EBT, so to speak. And you can only shake your head and say, Why on earth? Did I react that way? What made me lash out like that? That's not like me at all. Why did I do that? Can you try identifying with what I'm saying? It's not just me. And then looking back at the parable we share. But you know, there are other times. There are other times when we do things and we entirely fail to recognize or to realize just why we did it. Or even that what we did might be wrong. 
There are places in all of our lives in which we have a blinder on. It's like when you look through your camera and your phone and you take a photo. And then afterwards you discover you can't see anything in that picture because you had your thumb over the lens. And that's all you can see. We've all found these blind spots in our lives that trip us up. But even if we know this, there are times when we get tripped up anyway. That's why it's called a blind spot. The best people have them in day for all the good he did is came. We to the Samuels reminded time and time again he stepped his toe in spite of all the way he was doing to. The best people have this. The most faithful, loving people in the world have some blind spots. King David was no exception. In fact, if you look at these scriptures, these stories of the scripture, you'll feel, find that they're filled to the brim with flawed and faulty people. People with blind spots, good people, but people that make mistakes and they need God's guidance to get them back on track again. Let's look at the story of David and one of his blind spots. David's blind spot had a name. And that's right. In this particular case, his blind spot was the sheep. What's he do? He has your right here. Because now his audience has brought him into a bigger fantasy. So God does what God usually does in this kind of situation. He sends in his prophet. When things get rough, we send in the clients. God sends in the prophets. And in David's case, it was Nathan, as we just discussed. It's not easy being a prophet to a king. If the king doesn't like what you say, it could easily get you killed. So we have to be a little sly about it, sly about it. Nathan, the prophet that God sent to David, is created just as we should. He tells the story. This parable is like a mirror. You're fumbling around in the dark, you bump into some furniture, and you get all battered up. And all of a sudden, the light goes on, and you look in the mirror, and bam, you look awful. Who is that button who's trying to get bumbling around in the dark? David had a bit of a surprise to it, as I said in my book. At first, he listens to the story, and then he gets angry. And he can't believe this man behaves so bad, but then all of a sudden he turns on the light switch. And he turns the tables on the king. And David sees his reflection in the story of his country. Repentance is like that. Usually we need a little help from God to really reveal what our blind spots are. What do we have? But the good news is. Jesus came to set us free from a lot of things, but mostly from ourselves. Needing Jesus to shine his light on our flaws and our faults so that we're confronted with the truth of our humanness. That's what it means to stand naked in the sight of God. We need God to get our hearts back on track, to reveal us in our blindness, to coax us out of our hiding places. Jesus declared in his sermon to Nazareth, he says, I've come to give sight to the blind. I've come to help you get out of these spots. And we are the blind. All of us at one time or another. And we all need the love and the light of the Lord Jesus Christ to make us see. But when our sins are revealed, when we stand naked in the sight of God, that is when we can be bathed in the purifying and the cleansing light of the Lord of all. That is when we're made, quote unquote, in the image of Christ. And today, as we prepare to come into our time of prayer, let us ask for the light of Jesus to shine through us and among us. To reveal us in our sin and to cleanse us with God's ever saving grace. May we ever be blessed to see the writing on the wall by the holy finger of God. 
The clearest definition of sin for me is anything that separates us from God. Our awareness of him, our awareness of his love for us. David, for all the good things he did and the response he did for his call to replace Saul and to rebuild the kingdom and protect the ark and do all those things. And his mind stopped. There were those moments when God had to pull him up short and say, Listen, I'm in your life. Be aware of how far you've gotten off the path I've set for you. It's a matter of putting something before your relationship with God. Why is that difference? I just spent a week with the virtual reunion with the Northeast Coast, everywhere from Maine down to about a couple of mission centers. And it was quite an experience. I got into it because I've been dealing with a couple of little congregations back there. And I just wanted to see what it was like. And there was a time in my life when I was worried about my health. I fought this leg now for about four years and it's getting worse and worse. I began to find out that I had some other problems we had to deal with. As I got involved with this reunion, I ended up God let me give them a blessing. And then doing a couple of administrations virtually. I took part in several of their services. And since then, I've had about 300 emails from the people that were involved, just wanting to talk. They've got a little shortage on evangelist factor, I guess. But the important part about it that made me realize. And all of a sudden, I wasn't concerned with my knee being bad. And then other things come up. And on the first week of October, they're going to cut me open and do a bunch of stuff with my heart. Before we thought it was only minor, we were looking at it. And it got progressively worse. I began to worry about that quite a bit. I went through consultations and heart catheters and tests and stuff like this. And we decided, no, we. You're just going to have to get in there and get all my arteries fixed and a couple of hours of rest. And then we got to thinking, I don't have any symptoms. We can do it right now, but we don't know about the recovery time. And in September, we're due to spend a month in Hawaii. I have a couple of blessings to get there. One more day, Jack cave to the office of the evangelist. I'm going to do some other things with the little congregation I've been working with. There's people have been waiting for a year for us to be free to move around and do those things. And I told the doctor, I said, well, can I my kids, bless their hearts, arrange for Pam and I to have a little session? I was telling the doctor, you know, what's the possibility of being well before that happens? He said, no, I said, we, we get into you, that probably won't be good, the altitude, the closeness of people and stuff. He said, but you don't have any symptoms. He said, let's just watch. And then, if you're okay, he said, they have hospitals in Hawaii. He said, you probably get through that, and as soon as you get back, we're going to do it. Now, that's not a pity party for John O'Neill. What I'm saying is that as I got involved with this reunion, I like didn't bother me anymore. As I got involved with these individuals and sharing with them in services and in between services and on the Gmail, I wasn't scared anymore. And as I met virtually with the leaders of this union and they prayed for me and they talked to me, all of a sudden I realized and they reaffirmed for me that I'm going to be all right. God's got it. And so all the activities that went on in between these services didn't weigh on my mind. And I found myself, just as David was reminded, if you put God first, a couple of weeks ago, remember we had, we had a sermon on God's purpose in us rather than our purpose for ourselves. If we put God first in our lives, 
and we focus on responding to that, he will bless us in ways that we don't even know. That, my friends, is part of repentance. Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is saying, I realize, God, how I've been separated from you. Please bring me back. And I want to focus on you. And I want to live a different lifestyle. And that's part of our repentance. And I've experienced that because in all the hectic stuff I've done, I've got that and I realized that in spite of all the pain and everything else, I wasn't afraid because I put God first. And I was reacting with his people and I was responding to their needs the way they blessed me in my car. That's part of repentance. And the blessing is the absence of fear, the absence of distress. Now it's just, let's get it over with, let's get it gone. That's what we do today. God knew. And he gave us agency. Even the best of us were going to have times we left up cup and it was in the grid. We weren't aware that we let our lives get in such a place. Because he loved us so much, we arranged for the sacraments in our life, particularly the one we share today, knowing that we have an opportunity to renew that cup with the admonition that we should pray and we should look at our lives. And say, okay, what's most important in my life? Is it this job? Is it my bills? Is it this stuff? Is it what I want? We even got tripped up at 41. We pulled that drop. We have the opportunity to review that drop. We have an opportunity to realize just how much God loved us that He arranged for this to take place in our lives. That we might say, God, bring us closer to you. Help me get these other things out of the way. And for this moment, I pray and I ask that you might open your minds, open your hearts, and feel the love of your creative God. What we are about to participate. That you might feel renewed, that you might feel refreshed, that you might find things that you've never felt before. Relationship with your creator. And the result of that, in accordance with his purpose, with this act, we might feel renewed, we might feel strengthened, but more importantly, we might be refreshed in our awareness of how much we can bless us. In other words, each of us are so important to his plan for this creation. How we might share that with one another. Such a way that we hold each other up. He bless us at this moment and continue to bless us with the awareness that this brings about. Shall we continue our preparation for communion by singing hymn 524?
I ask you to kneel as much as possible, facing the altar while I give the prayer on the, the combined prayer on the bread and wine. Eternal God, we ask you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and wine for the souls of all those who receive them that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and the blood of your Son, and witness to you, O oh God, that they are willing to take upon him the name of your Son, and always remember him, and keep the commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them.
so great to hear the hymns played in the sanctuary this morning. It's now time for our uh, disciples' generous response, and uh, we continue to have uh, needs and expenses, but they're uh, minimal. But we appreciate your contributions, and we offer you the opportunity to place your offering in the plate at the back of the sanctuary as you leave the building, building this morning. So we'll pray over that at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we're indeed grateful for those many blessings which we enjoy. And we give thee thanks for those things which uh, would not be possible without the, those blessings. We pray, Father, that those contributions which we make might be used to further your kingdom building process and further your work throughout the world. For these things, we give thee thanks and offer this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Shall we continue to uh, our, our worship of our closing hymn, 645? <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 